is up, everyone, and welcome to the very first episode of Street Smarts. This webinar is specifically designed to help offer you more ways to grow and learn and reach the height of your game in esports, which might sound daunting and intimidating, but with all the guests and all the awesome people involved in Street Smarts, it's sure to help you out. And we've got so much already planned for the show that I just want to hop to it. But you might have noticed that we had some polls before the show for you guys to answer. And I was writing down those stats because it looks like we're going to help out a lot of you guys today. One of the very first polls was how long have you been playing Street Fighter? And the majority of you actually said you've never played it. Well, you're definitely in the right place today because Alex Valle is going to be on later teaching us a bit about fundamentals. But who we have up first is actually amazing. You probably know who UYU is. You know about their organization. And today we have Jamie and Drew joining us to not only give you insight on esports from an industry point of view, but for all those players out there who are a little bit curious about what they can do to maybe get into an esports organization, well, they are going to definitely give you the lowdown on that. But before we get to that, I need to put you guys on the spot. It wouldn't be a masterclass for nothing. So the poll is coming up right now. I need to know how many of you have your player resume? How many, have, how many of you have your deck ready? Go ahead and answer it right now because I need to know. Even 33% of you said you have what it takes to be a, a sponsored player. So if you don't have a deck, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe you might learn more than you thought you'd learn today. So let's check out these results. Majority of you, 81%, do not have a player resume. Well, esports is turning into something where you can make a career out of it, right? So it's just like a job and you are gonna need resumes to show your full potential because there are a lot of people vying for these spots. So before we get all to that, let's go ahead and kick it over to Jim, he and Drew to help with you guys trying to succeed in esports. Hi, I'm Jin Hee Kim, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of UIU. We're an esports organization that started in 2017, and we started in the FGC. And I'm Drew, the president of UIU, and we're proud to be an organization that's still very much so in the FGC. I feel like our roots are in the FGC, and that we we've gone out into other titles, other um, esports, but we really feel like the FGC is our home and where we've grown out of. So today we're really excited uh, to have this opportunity with Capcom to talk to you about um, you know, what it's like to be part of uh, a pro-sponsored player um, with an organization. So we're going to try to walk you through um, you know, and demystify some of the, the process and kind of explain to you like, what, what the relationship of um, you as a pro player um, is with the organization. So, what is the reason um, that a player would want to get sponsored? Why would you want to uh, become one of these sponsored players? Um, so there's things that you get as benefits of being a sponsored player. Um, this includes mainly, I would say, the, the, the biggest thing is offsetting a lot of the resources that it takes to kind of compete at the highest level, right? For the Capcom Pro Tour, if you're trying to qualify for the Capcom Cup, um, you have to do a extensive amount of travel, uh, so that's going to be travel costs, hotel costs, um, registration, registration, mm -hmm. right? Um, even just you know being able to um, uh, attend all these events, and also um, for a lot of people uh, to have the time to actually put the uh, practice hours in, you're going to need some sort of salary uh, to help offset things as well. Yeah, the costs, right? So. Um, it's kind of going back to uh, other kinds of support outside of financial. Um, it is also to help uh, grow your personal brand, right? Mm -hmm. So um, there's a part of you that's like the competitor, and then there's also the, the other part of you that's your personality, your personal brand, your social media presence, um, which you know is, is really important um, these days. And so the, an org can also help you with that they have hopefully the, the network of the other players or stream team members they can amplify things that you're um, tweeting about or the content that you're making well they have a um, whole team uh, or uh, organizations should have a whole team of content creators right so that's not just the actual 
stream team, which sometimes is labeled content creators. That's people who help to take photos at events, uh, edit photos, um, edit photos for social media, social media um, kind of experts, uh, people who record videos, videographers, uh, people graphic who edit designers. stuff together, graphic designers. So you get this whole kind of team around you to help build up your personal brand. Um, I think like, like to me, whenever people talk about personal brands, if you see one of my favorite examples is Smug. I think Smug has like such a great personal brand. Um, he's obviously a part of a, a great Oregon rise, but um, everything he does is just um, on stream, in person, in interviews. Um, he just really, he has his own kind of catchphrase and stuff like that too. I think that's, um, yeah. yeah, across social media too. He really portrays like what a good example of a top competing pro with a, a great personal brand who still fits well into his kind of orgs um, brand and everything like that. Yeah. Yeah, so I think that for everyone, you know, acquiring a sponsorship is not always necessary, right? It depends on what you're looking to do. And um, for those of you who want to be a pro player, who want to be um, turning this into something more than just competing when you can and competing for competition's sake, um, there are some aspects that kind of, may kind of seem like a job at first, but when you really think about it, it, it becomes stuff that all um, helps to build your personal brand, helps to elevate you to new fans, and um, just grows you as an individual. Yeah. So, well, one, we want the players to go to as many events as possible, as many tournaments as possible, um, and do well, and, and you know, hopefully they they um, do qualify to play at the end of the year in Capcom Cup. Um, but in addition to that, um, we want them to represent themselves, uh, represent um, themselves and the org in a you know, very professional way at the tournaments. And then in addition, um, at the tournaments, a lot of times um, we will be creating content, meaning we'll be filming videos. Um, vlogs. We may be doing vlogs, whatnot. So it's almost like sometimes um, it's, I think they start getting used to it, um, but it's like having a camera around you, like uh, a lot yeah. of times, right? And mm -hmm. so it seems kind of distracting at first, but um, I think a lot of players get used to that. Um, we also have like, we have sponsors that are um, great supporters of, of the FTC and a lot of the different tournaments. Um, Astro uh, usually is at most of the bigger tournaments. Um, you know, give, renting, like not renting out. Uh, well, they're like a title sponsor of yeah. CEO, Combo Breaker. Right. Yeah. Um, but then, so they'll have a booth and they'll have some called activations where um, the players come by sometimes to you know, meet with the fans or, 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 or do some, you know, play with the fans, play some matches with the fans and things. So in addition to focusing on getting out of pools and getting the you know, top 16 and all that, there may be times that you need to like, step out for a photo shoot or, or, or to do something. So so that's at the tournaments. Mm -hmm. And then outside of the tournaments, um, we do expect you to um, be active on, on social media, meaning that we expect um, the players to you know, stream, um, uh, tweet, sometimes, you know, Instagram and whatnot. Yeah. Um, and just really engage, engage with the community. Engage with the community and be a positive force in that in that kind of um, uh, dialogue that goes on in social media and the FGC. I think we have a very robust like uh, selection of ways in which you can um, kind of communicate with the fans and the community and other players and um, it's important that you always remember you can obviously you should be yourself in everything that you write but also that you're representing uh, your team and by association like everyone else on your team sponsors and all that but um, for me I think that we have certain players that are really great at one platform say Instagram Kami's like sensational on Instagram I don't understand how he understands that platform so well and then we have um, you know NL is one of the top Korean uh, fighting game streamers, I believe, if not mm -hmm. the top for Twitch. Um, 
but then he doesn't understand Twitter at all. So it's kind of like it's kind of like helping everyone figure out where they shine the best to, to connect with the community. So it's not like we force everyone into things that they aren't good at, right? It's it's um, amplifying the strengths and then also helping the weaknesses out a bit. So now that we've kind of talked about what it's like, what the relationship between a pro player, sponsored pro player and a organization is, the benefits that they both give to each other, um, let's discuss the question that I'm sure a lot of you guys have. Um, how do I become a pro player? What's that journey like? What's it gonna look like? What do I need to, what do I need to have? Do I need to win EVO? Do I need to you know, bring home all these medals? Uh, do I need to send you a highlight reel? What do I need to do? Yeah, so what do you need to do? Let's see, so... <laughs> <laughs> that was a <laughs> nice reversal. Um, I think it's really, there's no one way, right? Yeah, so, um, I kind of, I thinking about this and kind of thinking about um, how one applies to college, right? Um, and you kind of have, you know that you, you need to apply when you're a senior and you have a goal and you kind of have an idea of some of the schools that you want, like your dream schools and whatnot, but you don't wait until you're a senior to think about what's going to fill that application, right? Mm -hmm. You have to, from the time nowadays, like from the time you're a freshman or a sophomore, be kind of thinking about that senior year where you're going to have to apply and you're going to not only have to have the good grades and the good SAT, SAT or ACT scores, but then you're also going to have to show like, you know, um, whether it's your leadership or your clubs or your sport, you know, sports or whatnot. Sure um, so, you know, just like how I feel like you know, colleges, they look at you, at least in the U.S., very holistically, right? Okay, so the reason I um, use the analogy of of college, applying to colleges um, with you know, getting ready to you know, pitch yourself to a, a pro team is that um, similar to applying to colleges, there's a lot of different roads that, that you can take, right? And so um, we're gonna, we wanna talk to you about um, just through some illustrations of how, how some of our roster um, got to uh, become part of our UIU family, um, take you through some of that journey and then um, and, and to just show you how different it can be yeah, for each person. Yeah, there's been many routes. Yeah, so for each way. person. So I think um, if we go back three years, um, we were just, we're brand new, right? No one had ever heard of us, right? So, um, so it wasn't like we were getting inbounds uh, resumes or emails or DMs about joining our team. Um, we had to reach out to people, right? So we had um, to scout them and then we had to convince them and right. basically do a pitch to them. So it was actually the reverse situation of what we now get. Right. So let's use Junting as an example. Right? Okay. So if you guys don't know, if you guys, um, you know, are only Street Fighter But he plays players. Street Fighter. I know, I'm going to explain. <laughs> He's a Tekken player from Korea. He burst onto the scene at EVO in 2017 where he got winner's side top eight. Um, he only went to like a few tournaments that whole year. Uh, I just saw like an amazing talent and an amazing personality, just so much charisma. Also, I knew that he was like a bodybuilder too, so that was cool to me um, that he had this like other passion. And... Um, since then, you guys probably do know him because he has, this last year and the year before, competed in any Tekken event that also had a CPT event attached to it. He did try to compete in both. And mm -hmm. he became the first player to be top eight at a CPT and Tekken World Tour event at the, at the same tournament. Yeah, yeah. So so with someone like, like John Ding, um, you know, we did see highlights from from evo we saw mm -hmm. some highlights from um uh, i think it was a master cup um, oh yeah the and master then cup. and then he also streamed um and so um you know we started watching some of his streams right yeah. um and we were looking we were dipping into different people's streams 
um, to see what their personality was and, like. And we were we were speaking to kind of like um, community members that we had become friends with, mm-hmm. and that's right, and gained like the trust of. Um, kind of we we wanted to make sure we did this the right way. We've we had heard of stories of orgs coming into FGC and leaving, and we didn't want to be that. We wanted to really understand the FGC. We wanted to really do things the right way and do it very purposefully. So we had a lot of people who we could turn to for Tekken, uh, for Street Fighter, for... Right. Yeah. So that, that we should have mentioned that at the beginning is that mm-hmm. um, within the community, we did go, we did start talking to people that we respected in the community and asked them about players that they thought, um, you know, had the potential with the, the support, had the potential to be... Know, top 16 or, or, or whatnot, right? Yeah. Um, and so we got some references from people, but then we also were watching um, tournament footage. I was um, watching NLBC every week and WNF um, as well. Um, and then we were also speaking to Valle, who runs WNF. Mm-hmm. We, were, we were speaking to a lot of people actually yes. to kind of just scout around, right? So I think. Um, that example, um, what we'd like to get across to you guys is to go to your locals. That's um, a big one. That is go, a big one. go to your locals because you're going to get on stream. You're going to get to know the community members. Um, they're going to speak on your behalf. Um, you know, all, most of all of those are, are streamed, um, the, the bigger ones, but the smaller ones also are streamed or people are, are tweeting um, uh, results and things and just like engaging with each other um, in the community that, that way. So really highly encourage everyone to get out there. Yeah, your local your local scene becomes your kind of crew or even team before you ever join an org, right? That's, yeah. that's where you gotta really start. And when, when we go and talk to someone, um, at, we, we go traveling around a lot, so we go to as many locals as we can, um, and they all speak super highly of someone, that automatically gets that person on our radar. Yeah, and, and with, I think with Junting, he didn't travel that much internationally, but, but he did play locally all the him. time. Everyone knew him um, and, locally. And he was friends with... Roommates. Roommates and friends with very well-known, like with, with Sane and JDCR at the time, who was very well-known, right? And so, when you do practice and, and train and practice with others, um, mm-hmm. that does give you visibility. And like we said, he also was streaming all the time, so we could go in there and, and check out his game. Kami, so on, Kami on our team was it, it was and is friends with Punk and Do and um, uh, Smug. And so, and, he was going and to NLBC all the time. NLBC all the time, and you know, I we were working with Rise on a, a project for Evo Japan and. I was talking to Smug, I was like, who are the like who are the people you think should be sponsored? He's like, you gotta check out Kami. And we were already checking out Kami, but um yeah. So having the support of your 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 local scene is really yeah, very something I nice. Thank you so much for watching our very first segment. Now we have Drew and Jin He here live and in action. Welcome you guys, thank you so much for joining us in that first segment. Whoa mind-blowing especially for people tuning in who might not have realized just how much goes into esports and having an organization and what exactly they look for if you didn't know you can also click the q a button at the bottom of your screen if you want to submit questions and since you're all here you know that we did ask you to submit some questions during the application process and we've pulled a few from there too so we didn't forget about you guys but please send your questions because now that we have you guys here live we want to get more answers and we have a lot of good ones actually so first thing yeah. How are you guys doing? And welcome. Hey, hey, Persia. Hi, everyone. <laughs> We're really excited to be part of um, the inaugural Street Smart. Yeah, so, this is a great initiative. And, yeah. yeah, and thank you for for joining. And I'm um, looking forward to your questions. Yeah, it's really exciting, especially for me. If you guys know anything about EXO Academy, a lot of these points really hit home for me because esports is way more than just pushing buttons and playing games. Like you mentioned before, yes, you can go out there and win every event if you're good enough and you will probably get a sponsor. But there are so many different avenues and different ways that you can succeed in esports from square one all the way up to, you know, the highest of tiers, right? So for you guys as an organization, 
um, what other career paths can sponsors offer for their players? This was a question actually yeah. from the Q&A um, portion of the webinar, you guys. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, that's actually something very important to us. Um, we realized that in esports, um, I think FGC is a little bit different than things like League of Legends or Overwatch, where the age range that you compete is very kind of young. Um, FGC, you have people competing, you know, well into their thirties and still forties, and yeah. Um, but uh, you know, we really take it upon ourselves to make sure that people have a career outside of just their playing years. Um, so we we actually do some things, uh, even with our international players and. Um, to yeah. make sure that they have a lot of options outside of just playing. Yeah, so um, for, for me, I think um, part of, you know, as a parent, I'm, 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 so many of my players, um, I think of kind of as, as, as my, my kids, right? So um, I, I try to think about, you know, when they um, grow out of competition, um, you know, how can they have a career in in esports or the FGC. So Drew mentioned, for instance, like for my international players, I really drive home that um, and I try to help them uh, learn English <clears throat> because I think that opens up a lot of opportunities for them, even in their home countries, um, to get different jobs um, within whether within you know, an org or a lot of the brands that work within esports, so a lot of the companies. Um, yes. And then we also try to encourage um, growth path in that we encourage a lot of our players to um, try out commentary. If they have a certain interest in, um, you know, writing or um, they have like videography, mm -hmm. they, they are interested in like certain things, um, content production and things will we'll start to involve them um, organization. I mean, we try to speak when we do um, first bring on people, like one of the first things that we do is we, we ask them about their goals, like in competitively, mm -hmm. but then also about like kind of like their five year, 10 year goals. And then we try to support them and give them opportunities that will like grow them outside of just competing. So you know, watching you guys, hearing your answers to these questions, there's a lot more responsibility, I feel like, that should come from sponsors that people are probably not aware of. You know, they think so hard about obtaining the sponsor and probably little about everything a sponsor should be working with their players with as well. And I feel like you guys hit a lot of these different aspects, but you also mentioned uh, in your segment that there was a point when starting out where you were the ones reaching out. So a little bit of reverse roles and some applicants were really curious about sustainability. You know, how do you build this brand, bring these people on, but still stay s sustainable and able to provide all of these amazing opportunities to your, to your family, pretty much. Yeah. Um, so when we when we first started, um, I, I should actually just skip the whole like, oh, you know, uh, um, part about we we're actually going to you know, uh, I, I have a background in fashion. So one of the things that I was really like excited about was kind of um, bringing some um, of my fashion background into into um, into gaming and especially into FGC because um, another part of my background is I am like a, a child of a Taekwondo grandmaster and I just grew up in martial arts and going to tournaments like at martial arts tournaments and all that and when we just when I discovered I mean Drew, Drew's been a part of like um, watching the scene and, and playing um, I just fell in love with the FGC because it just reminded me of when I was growing up right mm -hmm. and so I kind of so initially, like for me, I was like, oh, like I, I love this community and I want to design some stuff for it. But then we started, you know, sponsoring some players. Um, everyone knows that like in terms of financially for um, for orgs like in the FGC, um, you can't really survive on like, you know, prize winnings and things because you, you guys know, like, even if you get first, second and third um, and then the orgs will take, you know, depending on the org will take between zero to up to, I don't know, I, I think fairly like up to about 20%. So if, even if you win a thousand dollars, like the orgs only getting what? Which yeah, that, I, like I, even I, even in other games right? that we're in, I always tell other people starting orgs or who have teams, don't expect to make 
like a significant revenue from winnings because A, you can't guarantee, even if I make the best Call of Duty roster of all time, I have the best Street Fighter players of all time, I, you can't guarantee they're gonna win, right, every time. And on top of that, it's a small percentage of the winnings. And also, I just don't think it's a good way to build kind of your, yeah. your business plan. So for us, a big part of sustainability is finding like-minded partners. I think Astro is a great example. You see them as a title sponsor for uh, CEO, which would have been this weekend, uh, Combo Breaker. Mm -hmm. um, I think they do stuff at Evo as well. Yeah, yeah. And the Tech World Tour, um, you know, they're all around. So uh, finding like-minded partners that really believe in the FGC and believe in the growth of it is really important for sustainability, not just for us as an organization, but for, we want to grow the whole thing together. So that's a very important thing when we're finding uh, the partners that we work with, so that they believe in the FGC. I yeah. I think coming, if you're thinking about starting uh, an esports org, like you really have to think about the long term of it and that there'll be many, many years of investment, meaning not just financial investment, but time investment and growing your, your, growing your community, your personal brand. And a lot of that, if you don't have the, the finances, the funding for, for, um, you know, paying for travel, paying for, um, and salaries and all that um there's other ways to do it right there's other ways that you can work very like in partnership and collaboration and you can give a lot of um support and benefit to the players that you bring on that are not financial right um and so there's there's other ways to do it but if you're coming into it because you think that you're going to make like shut loads of oh am i allowed to say that <laughs> you're allowed to, that you're going to make a lot of money let me tell you that like that's that's the wrong reason to come into it like absolutely. absolutely the worst reason to try to like start start an org um, a question from um you know when the applicants they mentioned about you know how to get into the industry and things like that but i think you guys already hit a lot of those things on the head in terms of you reached out to people that you respected within the community instead oh, yeah. of taking a direct you know oh, i have money let's just you know join our team type of approach it was very much sharing your passion with the people in the community who also mm -hmm. share that passion and then growing together, which is, I think is something mm -hmm. underrated when it comes to people joining the industry. So I really love that aspect from you guys. And for everyone tuning in right now, I hope you don't think that is it because we are going to jump into another segment because we're really starting to get into the meat and potatoes of esports from an industry point of view, which honestly, Janie and Drew is so fascinating to be honest, like answering all these questions, because I do think a lot of these are also things that one, people don't take into consideration or two, get lost in translation when people are just trying to be the next big thing, you know? So mm -hmm. this stuff is very important, but we are gonna hop back over to the player side of things, because in the very next segment, if you guys were wondering about that player resume, poll we had earlier well we're going to expand a little bit more on that so stay tuned and check this out i think once we had been established for a little while longer um we started getting some some inbounds um mm -hmm. through whether twitter or or email and so then fergus had reached out to us um, he's an and Irish he's a player. he's a Tekken player, yeah, from Ireland. And um, he sent us an, a nice email. Um, I, I don't think it was like really that formal, but he introduced himself and and almost like a cover letter, just in the email, um, talked about some of his like um, competitive accomplishments, and um, and then gave us links to his you know his stream and his Twitter and whatnot. But what really helped with that was, so he kind of wrote out what he wanted to do within Tekken and the FGC, which was not just compete, but to create content for the community to help people learn this game that he loves. And the very, I guess, fortuitous for him and ironic thing is that at the time I was trying to learn Tekken 7, which I had not played Tekken since Tekken, two or three. So I, I was actually watching his videos were among my uh, batch of videos I was watching to learn Tekken 7. So when he applied, I was like, I already, I already know who this guy is. He's been the one who's been teaching me how to do like these, you know, these character tutorials. So um, creating content can help. Yep. But yeah, this is an example of someone who sent in a resume. Mm -hmm. Of yep. sorts. And... Yeah. So we didn't, we didn't know that he was looking for a sponsor because a, a lot of times 
we don't know people are, are looking for sponsors or sometimes they have um i this think he a had a one. he had yeah, a tag no. in front of yeah. his name this so um we just assume they're sponsored right mm -hmm. um but it was like a, a clan it was a group of of friends that had a, a tag in front of their name and so we wouldn't have reached out to him if he hadn't reached out and, and to us. just a quick note on that if you really do want to be sponsored i would advise against putting anything in front of your name if it's like a meme or a joke, um, if it's a group that really supports you and you want to represent them or you want to represent your hometown or your, I've seen colleges like um, uh, WSU, I think at Evo had like a group out there, Kennesaw State at DreamHack. But if you aren't really on an organization but you want to get on one, sometimes signing up for tournaments with those letters in front of your name, when we look through results, we are like, oh, well that guy's already signed. And uh, both um, Kami and Smug were with Pi, and Smug tells the story of how a tier one who I can't name actually thought he was already signed, and so he couldn't actually he lost lost the opportunity to go to a team before Rise uh, due to them being like, "Well, he signed with this team Pi." So just something to think about, like before you throw letters in front of your name. Yeah. Um, and then I think um, Kizzy also sent in a really nice cover letter. Kizzy, um, Kizzy K, yeah, yeah K, he's, um, he plays Guilty Gear and sorry, he plays so many. He games. plays every game. He is yeah, so good at fighting yeah. games. So he also sent in a cover letter. So it wasn't like a fancy thing or anything. It was just a really nice cover letter saying who he is and his, uh, you know, his his accomplishments and what he was looking for. So then from there we, um, you know, we. Did we talked to him and we also just talked to the, the community and the, Kizzy is an example like we said earlier of like going to your locals like building good rapport with people over when you go to tournaments and stuff I, there's pr probably few people who are more beloved than Kizzy like everyone would give or that we talked to would give uh, the thumbs up, double thumbs up and like vouch for him so yeah. that's a really important thing like you know be a yeah. good as Kizzy would say don't be one So, given that these were successful examples of players who sent us emails, we interviewed them, they got on the team, they passed the vibe check. I'm going to regret saying that later. Uh, <laughs> but um, uh, what are some like do's and don'ts of emails that will either get them like disqualified or you won't even read it or... So, um, for every like good email, there's probably like 20... Yeah. 25 like that so I get a we get a lot of emails that's like and DMs too. hey how do you get on your team okay uh, or literally hey, that's it that's, that's it. the email I'm like okay I don't think I'm gonna answer that but um, <laughs> they can watch this instead um, or I'll be like oh I'm a Street Fighter player from and, and sometimes they'll say where they're from like some state or something and I want to be on your team Okay, I have their email. I don't. I don't have. I. I. I don't know your Twitter. I don't know. Like, do you stream? Do you like? There's no information. So that's like super unhelpful. Um, so that is not the way to reach out to a team. Um, or I have someone who spams our Instagram with highlight uh, footage, like maybe like oh, five tags, a day, tags and tags us. us. Yeah. And that's also okay once or twice okay I, I see you I'll check it out but like I would be honored like, if it was like every day and it was just UIU but it's like 40 different orgs that he tags or he or she tags yeah so so um so what was successful about Fergus and Kizzy mm -hmm. and Deoxys mm -hmm. is that they took the time to when um you know uh, give us kind of bullet points of what they've accomplished at their locals or regionals or you know some of the bigger tournaments what they've done um, recently. The, yes and what they're looking for you know what what they're hoping for when they join but then also giving us like links like give me your twitch give me your um the better ones you know they'll have their links and then they'll have like the, the stats on it too right they'll have like their the number of followers and whatnot so that i have something to follow up on and, and look through. So um, I think it's about the the information that, that you present. And um, and if it's done in a nice, you know, 
formatted and looks like you took the time, then that's great. And also, if you get our name right, because I also get a lot of emails where it's a different org's yeah. name. I remember a, a, a player who's made an Evo Top 8 before um, who sent an email to us that said, Dear Echo Fox, I would love to blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and I just remember being like, hmm. Well, just, I mean, like, we all do that. Like, when I have a resume and I'm, like, applying to jobs, like, you know, it's cut and paste, right? And you got to switch out the name, but please proofread it. Just proofread it. <laughs> all right, so um, just we've talked about at the beginning how we went out and, and um, scouted some players mm -hmm. um, you know, through tournament footage and, and like, lurking in, in their their Twitch chats and just um, at, yes, asking mm -hmm. asking leaders in the community for for the recommendations. Um, and then we also just talked about some examples of of players reaching out to us um, through email or DMs or whatnot. And so then I think the other way that um, we've we've gotten some players is through actually meeting them at, mm -hmm. at tournaments. So well, so it's multi level. Um, yeah. Sometimes we'll send out a resume, we'll read it, we, for whatever reason, won't have enough time to get through it or we don't have availability right then. Um, but getting to meet you in person and then you introduce yourself, like that's always, like, please always do introduce yourself if you see either of us or our general manager or um, Chelsea, our player manager works with us or other players. If you want to join the org, like make yourself known to them and say, I'm, I'm so-and-so, you know, I play this game, um, I made this character. You can even tell me your pool, and like if I have time, I'll I'll check it out, especially if you send a resume through. Um, and there have been times where, you know what, I can use an example here. So um, we didn't have at the time like room for another, uh, not just Street Fighter player, but like FGC player. When uh, JB first wanted to join UIU, but he introduced himself at Wednesday night fights, and then at subsequent tournaments, like almost every yeah, major, he'd something. always say hi. Um, talk to us and so I became invested in like, you know, we're friends now and, and I became invested in wanting to watch his matches and as I did I was like, he's really good um, He got scooped up by another org, um, but then things didn't work out there And so right before Capcom Cup, we were all getting ramen together um, Yeah, and we we're just like hey So that's nah, that's, that that's a good yeah, that's yeah. a great example of that that he always came up and 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 said said hello to us. Um, I think um, another example is like uh, he's a Tekken player, Lohai, who we had known about for a while, and it was kind of we were scouting him really early on, but he was on another team. Um, but then also at different events, um, spoke to him, got to know him, and then found out that he was you know, looking for another org and so I wouldn't have known that because I wouldn't have reached out to him um, about it but from the tournament and having a conversation um, that happened. M Maureen who's our um, our Street Fighter uh, I guess the the new is she the newest? Mm -hmm. um, and I mean I had heard about her but then it was at a, at a tournament I think at CEO I was um, kind of watching her matches and when she and beat just, Dogura? Yeah, I didn't see that one but like I was watching her um, at the, the matches and just seeing how not only I knew she played really well but how she was conducting herself and um, at the tournament and with, with the other people and things so she she doesn't know that but like I watched her at that She'll tournament and, and I watched her at another <laughs> tournament and same a little with, creepy. no I know well, <laughs> same with Oil King like I saw him at Evo um, 2018 in, in, uh, in, in the first Evo in Tokyo and he he doesn't know, but like I kind of was like following his different pulls and, and just uh, you know watching to yeah. see like how he was doing and um, I think at final round we actually had a nice chat with him and um, just saw his personality and kind of what he was like. It's always the Rashid players. Did you I, notice that? I just I, someone told me like it's all these Rashid players. I never think about the character. Um, I think about the person, but I, I, I never think you about the characters. Think about the characters. Oh, actually, yeah. There's some characters I'm like, oh, I don't really, I can't, I don't like to watch them. So like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that's just me. Like, <laughs> that's just. <laughs> it's like an inside joke but um so at the tournaments like 
please, like Drew says, if you are at a tournament and you see a member of, um, whether it's staff or a player, um, you know, do go up and, and say hi and make yourself yeah. uh, known because um, that's... Even if you don't feel like you're at the level yet to be on UIU, but you eventually want to be on a team or UIU or a team like us, make sure you come and introduce yourself. Let me know who you are. I've met people um, at a local in Atlanta, but then also at majors who are like, yeah, this is my second year of playing. Uh, you know, I only knew about um, Street Fighter Online. I didn't know we had these offline things. And now I know about the FGC. And I've seen those people's growth paths. And um, I have a lot of friends who own kind of, uh, I guess they're called like, in COD, they're called amateur orgs, but they're professional orgs. Mm -hmm. And they're looking to get into fighting games. And so when those people ask me, Maybe this person's not right for UIU, but then I'm like, there's this kid. He's like been grinding. He's on the come up. You should definitely take a look at him. And I'll always give that kind of um, recommendation. A lot of people do come to to us when they're looking at the FGC to kind of say, hey, who are some people worth looking at? Yeah, yeah. So, so please say hi. We're friendly. So we just went over with some of the examples of our, our players and how they came to be part of our team um, as we said some of them we scouted um, online through tournament videos through their twitch um, talking to community members um, and then some of them came to us with uh, emails cover letters or or, or little resumes um, and outlining like what their accomplishments are um, their social handles, their numbers, um, and then we, we interviewed them. And then the third way we talked about was we met people when we attended um, tournaments, right? And we would get to know them over a, a, a period of time because they, they came by and said hello to us or we watched some of them. So, um, so kind of to summarize what we've been talking about, um, just in terms of what about these people like stood out to us um, to bring them onto the team? It was yes, it was the results or or we thought their um, potential. Mm -hmm. If we gave them the the right support to reach certain competitive results, um, so results and then um, social right their social presence. And that means that um, whether they're active on, on, on Twitter, um, interacting with the community or sharing content, um, whether they're streaming, um, which means that they're also engaging with the community and, and their, their followers and kind of giving back yeah. when you're talking about YouTube like videos, YouTube videos, content, uh, tutorials for the community, um, holding your own tournaments. I mean, especially in the current environment we're in we're in uh, june yeah. 2020 right now holding online tournaments um it's really seeing you taking initiative yeah. right um and so i think that's where we kind of want to talk about um a really another really important thing at least for us and i hope this is true for most organizations is you know what you bring to the community us giving you the support um, the financial support and then we talk about you know the the support for content creation and all that like um, how that ends up benefiting the community and going back to my college analogy is like if we ex if the college accepts you then how do you benefit your classmates and then and then with the resources that you get from those four years how do you go out and, and, and benefit other people and benefit so. the world after you graduate well, yeah, so getting really lofty here, but I know we're talking fighting games, but like I, I, I do think that um, for me, like what I get so much um, uh, like good feels, what's that right word? Vibes, like, good yeah, vibes. I don't know what the, you know, Zoomer word is for, but <laughs> <laughs> what makes me feel good is um, watching our players use their platform and like to um, engage with the community and then to do like do initiatives and like support 
support and kind of give back to the community, right? So when I, when sometimes we um, talk to our players about which tournaments to go to, and there's some in um, countries that maybe don't get as much like spotlight, then I really encourage them to yeah. go to that tournament in Greece or go to that tournament in, in Peru or something because I think it's one exciting for the player, but then exciting for the community to have an international, like more well-known player come and be part of that tournament, right? And so once they're, one, they're there, I want them to also be a really good representative, not just of our org, but just of the, Tekken or Street Fighter. Yeah, and of, of the FGC. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, um, and so we really like, encourage our our our, um, our players to think about the community how to help it grow mm -hmm. how to create more opportunities for it, more people mm -hmm. um, and this is kind of where the responsibilities of like when we have sponsors that helps us support the players and some of the initiatives that that we have tournaments or or little like UIUFC things that we have here um, but then the players doing contents or shout outs for our sponsors that also benefits everybody because it you know the 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 more that we can encourage people to support um the teams with players or tournaments meaning like the, these sponsors whether they're endemic or or non-endemic um that just i think that helps the community have more resources right yeah. it helps Tournament organizers have more resources to put on better tournaments. Um, it puts more spotlight, um, maybe more prize money into some of the tournaments. Um, and and so it kind of try to um, make the players understand that when they are doing some uh, sponsorship deliverables. Uh, deliverables, like it is to kind of we're trying to it's not selling it like people are like oh you're selling yeah, it's not you're selling out this and this it's not selling out it's buying in i stole that from someone <laughs> else it's not selling out it's buying in and it's helping us to um elevate the position that our org is in because it's just like any big player right like without your daigo like and without your uh who's the biggest gamer in the world ninja right without your ninja for fortnite like championing it and taking it to these new heights and getting on Ellen and the Today Show and doing all these kind of crazy things. You need those kind of uh, champions to help um, the, the scene. But what we don't want to happen is for you to become this huge star, forget about everyone else that, that came before you, forget about grassroots, forget about your locals and just you know peace out with, with the checks and whatever. We want to make sure that everyone always leaves places better um, and always puts things back into the the ecosystem puts things back into the community and helps to build this all up together. Rising tide lifts all boats is really something that we believe. And we want everyone in FGC to do well, from the players to the TOs to the developers to everyone, artists. It's all a virtuous cycle. We're all in this together. Yeah. So, um, uh, so we've talked a lot now. So. Definitely have. Uh, <laughs> I hope that we were able to shed a little bit of light into the process of um, you know what it's like to be a sponsor how to become and approach an org to be a sponsor player and um, you know some of the the benefits and how you can grow from it and how you can help the community and um, yeah we're excited to hear some of your your questions yeah, um, afterwards and you know um hopefully uh soon in the future we don't know exactly when we will be able to meet you guys at some great tournament um and and if we we're there and we see you please come by and say say hi or you know tweet at us whatever yeah. you know we're like yeah. If you see on three. <laughs>
All right. Well, that was absolutely amazing. Honestly, I felt like you guys covered so many different aspects when it comes to a player, how they should present themselves, how they should approach a sponsor and all of the above. But one of the questions from our applicants was very interesting. Let's say you, you know, dot all those I's, cross all those T's and you still get a no. How does a player move from that and how should they interpret that answer? Yeah, it's definitely a good one. Um, sometimes, you know, it, we've, we ourselves have gotten applications or a player come to us who fit every criteria that we're looking for. I think I spoke about JB, right? It, like he fit every criteria. We just at the time didn't have the room on our roster to pick up a new player. Mm -hmm. um, and that wasn't just like in Street Fighter, it was in general. Um, we have certain limitations, especially with FGC, with the amount of travel and stuff like that. And so, a no is not always a indication of your actual um, your actual resume itself, uh, your actual like you know ability to be sponsored. It's sometimes is simply not it's the just, right time. Yeah, it's just timing, right? So it's um, it is timing. Um, uh, I think for some folks, if they you've gone through the part where you've had the interview and all that, and it doesn't work out in a sponsorship, you you can also ask like, are there areas that I could improve yeah. on? Um, was there something about, you know, um, you know, but yeah, was it like, do I need to stream more? Is it my results? Um, that type of thing. So you, you can try to ask for feedback. And then also orgs, all different orgs are looking for different things. So, um, you know, I'm beating the college thing, like to death, the analogy, but like <laughs> not every, you know, like a lot of, um, you've got like, every org is looking for um, something else. To, uh, and so I would encourage uh, you to like look at mm -hmm. the orgs carefully, kind of understand like who their players are already or like what the personality is and, and kind of um, uh, think about that way as you're uh, applying and, um, and yeah. then just keep, keep trying. Persistence, no, yes. persistence is, is important. And um, not just in, the same org that you go back to over and over but in general um there's new orgs or there's orgs that i i know of like who have said to me you know we're looking at fighting games but now is not the right time but can you give me a list and so they're in a few months gonna start looking at street fighter players but not right now you know mm -hmm. so persistence is key mm -hmm. and a lot of things in the industry take a long time to come to oh, fruition yeah. on top of that so patience yeah. Is, is very important and you know we'll get to fighting game patients a little bit later but <laughs> there's still some more really important questions from our view our uh, attendees right now actually one of them i saw in the qa which guys don't forget you can submit your questions still we'll be answering all day and although we'll be hopping over to alex Valle's segment next at the end of our show everyone's coming back for a nice little round table chat so just keep sending those questions away. We're gonna try to get to it as much as possible. But for right now, I saw a really good one about internships because like you mentioned, not everyone is gonna get accepted, but what is your take on internships? Is that a thing within teams? I know I've seen those positions open in other esports organizations, but I'm really curious to get your take on it. Yeah, um, yeah I, I think like any industry, um, you know, there's, there are opportunities for, for internships um, and so, you know, there's um, in in management, um, kind of in, in content in content creation. You know, if you if you are um, a, a graphic artist or or you're into doing video editing, um, that there are a lot of opportunities. As we mentioned, like before, when people were asking about like starting an org and financials involved in it. I mean. Um, uh, it is a big investment, right? And so in order for us to support a lot of uh, the, the players and the things that we do, we do need a lot of um, talented people to, to help us. Now, we um, tend to like, when we've had, um, I guess we can call them kind of interns, like people have reached out to us and said, oh, we want to like do some video editing. Um, and we can check out their portfolio and whatnot um, and say, oh, this might be, this might be a good fit. We kind of have a, I guess you could call it an internship because it's almost like a trial period where we see it's like um, how they work. And then we, we also tell them like, it's a time for you to check us out. And if, if, Make sure it's if, good fit both if ways. a good fit, and if this is kind of what you are looking for, and if you have that, you know, um, 
extra five, 10 hours a week to do this. And then, and then it kind of, after a couple months, we'll, we'll give them a, a, a full time, not a full time, we'll give them an actual offer, you know, yeah. a salaried offer. And I think the um, same can be said for players that are on our content, create like come out to us first as content creators, um, but start to travel to more events, start to kind of take that more seriously. And, uh, you know, there's definitely the chance to kind of, I almost want to say graduate from uh, stream team or content creation or being affiliated with the organ in another way to becoming a pro or pro yeah. player. Or, or staff. Or staff. Right? Yeah. Or staff. Because we've the had other others that are have volunteered to like, you know, help with social media or something and then um oh no on the on the content team and we find out that they have like a passion for or like, you know, a, a lot of Editing um or lot of experience um doing social media for instance yeah and so then we'll give them different opportunities so yeah if you guys have um you know uh, some skills or um you should be reaching out and um sending in your resume or your behance or or your you know if you want to write the a, a little like um portfolio post or something yeah, you guys might not realize how easy it is to intertwine um, maybe a hobby or a passion of your own into gaming. So yeah. just take that into consideration, forge your own path if you don't see anybody doing what you're doing, and that might also help you stand out. Um, we are definitely going to be answering more questions for you guys. Jin He and Ju are also going to be answering some of your questions via text um, in the QA box. But don't forget, we are going to have everybody round up at the end of the show to answer even more questions. So we're not done yet. Because coming up next, Uncle Baye is stepping on up. And if you remembered at the beginning of the stream, we asked how many people have played Street Fighter and a lot of you said never. So this lesson is about to be crucial. It's going to teach you everything you need to know and you're going to get a little bit of history from Alex Baye himself. You guys check this out. Don't go anywhere and enjoy. We'll be back at, right afterwards with Alex Baye live and in the flesh to answer more questions, of course. So watch, pay attention, take notes and send us your questions. Hey everyone, and welcome to Street Smarts. I'm Alex Valle, former Street Fighter champion, tournament organizer, community mentor, lover of all fighting games. And today I'm here to teach you about the world of competitive Street Fighter. But before we get into the world of competitive Street Fighter, I'm gonna take you guys back, all the way back to where this started, where I started, where the community started, just to get a glimpse of how we were then and how we are now. All right, so if you guys remember Street Fighter 1, I, I was nine years old. Okay, I was super, super young at that time. And man, that game wasn't really played together. It was kind of like you played just to the computer, you beat Sagat, you get your ending, and that's it. So, I mean, it, the game was awesome. People liked it, but it, it wasn't, it didn't have the same impact as this game right here Street Fighter 2. Street Fighter 2 was the game that really brought everybody together, right? You can select from eight fighters, the graphics are great, the, the music was awesome, it was available in every arcade, you know, the convenience stores, pizza <laughs> pizza parlors, laundromats, you name it. So, and wow, you know what? I'm gonna take you by the history. So if you guys seen one of these machines back then, you guys know what I'm talking about. So, oh man, this is, <laughs> this brings back so much memory because there was like 10 to 15 people, 20 people around each one of these machines. Nobody knew what they were doing. I didn't even know what I was doing. I had to pick Chun Li to kind of figure out like how to do her special moves. And I figured out her lightning legs was just to kick, push the kick buttons really fast. So, but as style started to form and people figured out the moves, uh, the game matured and Champion Edition came out, Hyper Fighting, Super Turbo, and all those great Street Fighter 2 games came out and people started to get really good, really good. So for me, uh, Street Fighter Alpha is where uh, I started to shine. This is the era where I became uh, the Street Fighter champion for the US. And there was no easy feat because remember, I was that kid just trying to mash lightning legs all day, you know, playing Ken and barely started doing uppercuts to where now I have, you know, a good grasp 
of the the history of the the competitive world of arcades and any convenience stores that were around but uh street fighter alpha 2 was the one that really launched my uh my championship career you know playing and winning my first major event and i was like only 18 at the time so but such great history and you know then we were still playing on you know american arcade sticks and they were big and you know our hands were getting kind of beat up but that was just the american style of things because everybody was mashing the sticks back then still so uh but many great memories there i fought daigo umahara in 1998 for the world championship and daigo took it and he was that new kid uh, around the block i think he was only like 17 years old i was you know in my 20s already and i was starting to see this new generation of world international competitors come into the scene so from just seeing the game to seeing the people it's always been about the people and you've seen the infamous match with uh daigo umahara and justin wong in the game called street fighter 3 third strike and that famous uh evo moment 37 where daigo parried uh justin's chun li super to get the win that was amazing everybody got crazy and the, the competition was spread like wildfire you know internationally then unfortunately there was no street fighters until for like eight years later or something so street fighter 4 came on it was like a godsend like wow you know the capcom's actually coming back with another street fighter and you know i was way seasoned at the time 2008 2009 uh, but there was a whole new generation of players that didn't really know how to play street fighter yet it was their first street fighter and uh, i took it upon myself and many of the old school cats you know came out there and said hey you know what this is how to play street fighter let's start creating events uh one of my uh good friends uh and mentor jimmy win in socal uh we got together and we started creating these awesome events weekly events uh online events major tournaments and uh street fighter 4 went into it just started the next renaissance of competition and here we are today with street fighter 5 and you know, I'm fortunate enough to help you guys to get your start in the world of Street Fighter competition. All right, guys, we're ready to play some Street Fighter, but before getting into that character select screen, you got to figure out what you're going to play on. And a lot of people overlook uh, this stuff because they just want to mash buttons and get into it. But what's important about this stuff is that you got to know what your hands are comfortable with. So. If you guys recall, and I was talking about the history of Street Fighter, you probably saw one of these. I mean, not in this size, but in regular scale, right? Um, and the controllers were pretty hard because, you know, at least in the American arcades, you had to play on, like, what's considered a bat top, and people are just mashing buttons. They don't know what to do. So it wasn't really the, the most optimal uh, to use uh, for everyone. And as... Street Fighter became more of a console-based or available on consoles and, and uh, the PC. People had a choice of what you can use for a peripheral. So me, I mean, I have like some meaty hands here, uh, not very small, so I do require a bit of space. And the stick that I currently use is the Fighting Edge from Hori. It's got Japanese parts. Um, it's got nice placement for the palm, so you know I have enough breathing room. Um, and the buttons are, you know, this is uh, all Japanese based. What you would see in a Japanese arcade cabinet, uh, it fits really well uh, with your fingers. So you can kind of slide, it, it, depending on your technique and how you play, you can slide the buttons or you can play without hurting your hands. Because in American sticks, like these, back in the days, they were all straight in the line. And that, to some people, it hurt their hands. Or... You may not be too fond of playing on a fight stick, and it's okay. Some people play on your pad. This is a game pad. This is a, the stock uh, DualShock controller that comes with the PlayStation 4. Right out the gates, you're ready to play some Street Fighter. It's, you know, some of the best players in the world right now, like Knuckle Do, uh, Punk, and, you know, Luffy. They play on a game pad. So don't feel bad if, you know, you don't want to catch up with the old school guys. It, it, what's most important is that you know what works with your hands so you can execute the moves uh, to play your match. 
You know your history. You know what peripheral you're going to use. Now it's time to select your character. This is extremely important because selecting your character is a part of you. It's about your personality. It's about uh, what interests you about this game. Uh, many people can choose to pick like, oh, who, who are the best players in the world using? I want to use their characters. That could be an option, but my suggestion is to pick a character that you feel great about. It, it doesn't matter how good or bad they are. It's, a, it's about what keeps you vested in the game. For me, I pick, I'm a Ryu player because I like an all around type feel. You know, I want to control the pace of the game. Um, and then there's people that can pick, oh no, I want to pick an evil guy. I want to pick Akuma. He looks so cool. The looks of a character, play them, right? If you want to play a fast, very fast and agile character, a ninja character like Ibuki, play that character. So you see where I'm getting at. It's what interests you about the character personality. It, it goes hand in hand to your playstyle, which you will figure out. All right, guys, we're ready to play some Street Fighter, and we're going to start with some fundamentals of this game. And to do that, you're going to have to learn about footsies, which is also called the neutral. You're going to need to know about frame data. You're going to need to know uh, what game style, gameplay that you want to play as, like a, and a rush down, defensive play, uh, grappler. And then, of course, you're going to have to learn meter management. So for the first part, we're gonna talk about footsies, which typically means the neutral game. Uh, where you are in the screen determines what attacks you're gonna use. So say for instance, uh, if you're gonna be very close to your opponent, the quick attacks are, are probably gonna be the, the go-tos, right? Because each attack does reward you, uh, you know, a different set of advantages and disadvantages. And if you're playing more of the mid range, which is a little bit more spaced out, now you're gonna have to use longer ranged moves in order to close in the attacks. And same, of course, if you play from full screen. Now, some characters may be limited to the amount of attacks that can reach your opponent. Uh, my character, Ryu, I can reach him by throwing a fireball, right? Or I can kind of jump in to close the distance, but not every character is gonna be able to do that. A character like Dalsum, he has long limbs and he might be able to reach uh, from full screen and torment you that way. So it's very, very important what you use in every single range of the stage. Frame data is goes hand in hand to the neutral game or the footsie games because you have to know which moves are safe or unsafe or have advantage or disadvantage. So let's just say Ryu's slowest move is his sweep. Has a lot of, you can see how slow it is compared to his, his jab, right? A jab is really, really hard and not practical to punish. But the sweep is, if I miss a sweep at this range, most characters can hit me before I'm able to block again. So you're gonna have to, and, and this is the basis of, of frame data because you need to know how fast or how slow each one of your attacks are. This includes special moves and critical arts. So uh, please explore your character fully to understand which moves are gonna give you the most advantage because that's where you're gonna get the KO more so if you're disadvantaged and you may lose the round. So good luck. Okay, next. We're gonna go into what style of play you're gonna be, all right? Or you're gonna compete as. So, uh, with with Ryu, the character that I picked here, uh, he's very versatile. He can play uh, in your face, very rush down if he wants to, or he can kind of play such a, a zone and kind of slow and methodical pace, and just like throw fireballs until you jump over them. And I can do my you know traditional uppercut and if they jump over it and that's kind of sets that pace of play or i can go all the way in the back 
and barely do anything because I have now I have the life lead and they have to get me right. So there's many ways I can play this character, uh, and that's why I I like uh, using Ryu um, because he's very versatile. All right, guys, one of the most infamous styles in Street Fighter V is rush down. So Karen is one of the characters that makes the rush down style really really shine in the world of Street Fighter. She is really fast and she does a lot of damage and she's used by some of the best players in the world. Like look at these normals, right? When I was talking about playing a footsie game, uh, look the walk speed that she has and her ability to get in close to the opponent to inflict a lot of damage. And there you have it. Okay, another notorious style is the turtle or the the zoner style. So the turtle or zoner style, it, that just means you're a very defensive player. And the character that comes to mind is Guile. Guile, he doesn't have the extensive, uh, you know, fireball motions where you have to curl the, the joystick or move the thumb over to, to perform your special move. You just hold back. And then you tap forward after a few seconds and you throw a sonic boom. And this is the, the quickest uh, fireballs in the game. And this really, really sets the tone in every range, from up close to far, far away. And what this creates, it creates uh, the opponent to be very impatient. And when they're impatient and they want to jump in, you do his infamous flash kick. So this is a, a very notorious style because it's one of the most important styles uh, for many characters. Many characters like Guile uh, excel in the defensive realm. But don't be fooled. Guile can also be very offensive too. He's got many many moves uh, that can close the gap and really change the pace and you're like wow I thought he can only be played as a defensive zoning character. Not necessarily. But he is known to play defensively because that's where his attacks shine the most. All right, for this next style of gameplay, we have the grappler. And of course, we're gonna pick my man Zangief uh, because from the, that range, you can throw your <laughs> opponent right off the bat. How scary is that, right? So you gotta be really careful on uh, you know defending versus this character because there is no escape from his spinning power driver. You cannot escape it if you're in range. Normally you can uh, tech or evade a throw, a normal throw, but not the spinning power driver, right? So, so some of you guys, you don't wanna play an ultra aggressive character. Some of you guys may not play a defensive character, but you wanna play something very unique and you like throwing and you know, it's what a wrestler does, right? So this character is very slow. Um, I mean, you can't give him everything, right? Because he does a lot of damage once he gets in. And that's the beauty of Zangief because he doesn't really have to land the spinning power driver. He can just do his big, strong moves once he's close. When he is close, his, his moves become much more deadly because they do a lot of damage and they can net you some crush counters. So don't be fooled. Once he's in, he can be very, very aggressive or he can just wait and see if you're panicking and trying to jump away from his spinning power driver and he can get you. And, if you, and you can't really jump in on him either because he has his lariat. So this grapple style can can kind of group into a rushdown once you're in and just keep looping a spinning power driver to jumping in, get another throw, and then your opponent's done. <laughs> so this is one of those styles where it takes a while to get used to but the reward is probably the greatest out of every style there is. So, good luck on this one. All right, one of my new favorite characters in the world of Street Fighter V is Kage. Now, it, on the surface, he may look like um, a, a crazy looking character, which that I gravitate to, but he is a mix-up heavy powerhouse character. and. This character is, is very fast, he's agile, doesn't have that much health. Most characters that um, do have a lot of mix-up potential don't have a lot of uh, health. Like for instance, Ibuki or um, Karen, Akuma, 
those type of characters. So you got to be really careful on how you approach because you can play ultra aggressive, uh, but where they shine is their mix-ups as well. And say, for instance, for Kage, with this V trigger that he has, you know, he can do a quick uh, dash punch or he can teleport and mix you up from the other side. Little things like that that add a little bit more flavor to the traditional like Shotokan style, like uh, Ryu just throwing fireballs and then getting in another range and throwing more fireballs and uppercuts. That's very traditional. Kage doesn't really have stuff like that because his fireball is just uh, very close prox proximity range or he has his red fireball, which does go full screen, but it has a bit of a startup. So uh, with Kage, you can inflict so much damage all around and corner carry, look at that nice damage that he has, right? You can also mix up your opponent by going or getting in. So wild, right? Like you wouldn't think a character like this in Street Fighter would exist, but um, you know, there's a little bit of many styles in this game. And I mean, Kage, you can still play offensively or defensively but that element of mix-up, Ryu doesn't have, or Ken doesn't have, or lack thereof. So it's your job to figure out where your character shines in that type of category. So please explore characters like Kage, you know, Ibuki, um, you know, and many characters in the games that can really <laughs> mess up your opponent's minds from cross-ups to corner carries to critical arts and all the craziness that comes with it. Alright guys, let's talk about that meter management. And in Street Fighter, meters were born in Super Turbo. And Super Turbo was the very first Street Fighter game that had a super meter and everybody just had one super. Here we are in Street Fighter 5. Some characters have multiple supers. Some characters have um, multiple V triggers and all of these things will completely determine how you're going to defend yourself or you're going to seal the deal and get that round and for the character of my choice of course is Kage and he's very dependent on meter because that's where he gets most of his damage uh, for instance if I'm doing his bread and butter combo that I want to corner carry with I've already used one bar, so I can no longer do his super because you need three bars in order to do his uh, critical art. And that means that I have to gain the meter back again. So in order to get meter again, you're gonna have to fight for it, right? You can't build a meter, um, or you get you build the least amount of meter if you don't touch your opponent. If you, if you hit your opponent, you get the most amount of meter back. If they block, your attacks you still get a little bit of meter um, but it's better than nothing so you have to pick and choose wisely where you're going to um, start creating your plays in order to maximize your damage so you see the the combo that i did actually start that again see uh, the, the combo of choice that i do without any meter is that which is 342 with meter which is my critical art it's from 342 to 482 so you see the big difference in meter management sure you can win games with no meter and whatsoever and you can depend on your footsie game your game style and, and whatnot but uh, sometimes you're going to need that extra uh, that extra damage to seal the deal defensively and offensively and especially still with your V triggers too when you activate uh, this will help you in your neutral game to get the damage that you need so every character has many different ways to uh, to gain V trigger to gain uh, your meter for supers so please choose your normals wisely because that will cost you the game if you don't have enough to finish the round so good luck guys 
all right guys that was a lot of street fighter so um but it's a good thing you know i wanted to get you guys uh ready to compete you know this is the stuff that uh that i was excited for when i got into this thing so uh, you know from figuring out what peripherals you're gonna play on to what characters you're gonna pick to the game styles if you're gonna be a rushdown guy or you're just gonna be a turtle whatever you're gonna do to like torment your opponent because that's what brings the fun and joy about this thing you get you get to feel all this stuff right and you know some of you may have like more questions and, and figure out man you know alex uh it, it's still kind of hard and i'm still not there and that's okay you know it took a lot of us a lot of us to kind of figure this stuff out word of mouth you know our our mentors our peers community members and that's why i'm here and that's what many other pro players and tournament organizers feel free to reach out to us on you know, the east coast west coast worldwide whatever continent you are there is an event you know the uh, capcom pro tour is a worldwide event and that wouldn't have been built without the community leaders that we have in place today so if you want to reach somebody like me on Twitter, you can reach out to me at the Alex Valle. And, you know, I cannot wait to hear from you guys and get you guys ready for the next event. So feel free, reach out to me and let's get you started. We are here live and in action. Thank you so much again, Alex, for that amazing lesson. I felt like I've been playing fighting games for a while, but I even learned a bunch of things so how are you doing welcome oh, i'm doing fantastic Persia. it's been a long time i've been i been know for a long, long time so it's always great to see you likewise likewise and you know all of our attendees they have so many questions really really good ones um i'm just gonna start listing them off here because it seems like everyone may have a general grasp of what they should be doing, but they're finding a disconnect in certain areas, which is why you're here. You're perfect for it. Um, even one of our attendees in the chat right now, they were mentioning how they have kind of a defensive and reactive play style and they're using Nash, but they feel like they're experiencing a disconnect between their style and finding a character that fits that. So what kind of advice would you give to players trying to find the one, the character for them? Well, it, it's it's definitely growing pains when it comes to uh, finding your style or finding your, you know, your personal growth, you know, because it's like we're all getting beat up. We're trying a new character. Even me, like, if there's a new character that comes out, like I was trying Seth, for instance, right? And I'm like, oh, character's got an uppercut, character's got a dive kick. No problem. I'll go to rank. It doesn't matter who I am. I'll go to rank and I'm just getting my butt kicked for like 10 games in a row. So don't feel bad. I like that. <laughs> okay, don't feel bad at all, okay, because it happens to the best of us. Uh, what, what matters the most is if you can sustain the happiness of the character that you picked and the style that you're passionately, like, moving forward with. Because if you can't hold on to that, then my recommendation is to move into another style. I mean, it, it's just, it is, it is what it is. Um, give yourself a timeline, you know, don't, don't stress too much. You know, it, because once games don't turn fun anymore, that's when you need to take a little break, so. It's true, it's true. You yeah. know, people talk all the time, pick a top tier, pick a top tier. I've never once had as much fun playing a top tier than with characters that I genuinely love. I've always played like trash with top tier characters and I pick some low tier that I adore deep in my heart and I play 10 times better. So it's really all about what you enjoy, what you find fun because that love will show through your gameplay. Yep. Um, and of course, lab work, Hard work, practice is always important. And we had another really good question from the attendees who mentioned how, and I know we've all gone through this, to this day I still go through this, but how do we go from spending hours and hours in the lab practicing one thing, get it down 100%, then the second you get into a match, it's all gone. What, what do we do about this, Alex? Oh, well, that, that comes with experience. So it's easy to go to the gym and hit like, you know, the speed bag or the punching bag, because it doesn't hit back. But <laughs> as soon as something does hit back, you're like, oh no, all these other emotions start to come out. So that uh, I would say is equivalent to having butterflies in your stomach when you're very nervous about things. Every time you experience something over and over and you have more confidence on it, I can guarantee you, you'll be ready. You'll be ready to execute better. You'll be ready to analyze things better. 
and then having that conversation too. It's very important to have a conversation with your peers if you don't understand something. Don't let it go. Just remember that in your thought, like, damn, I keep losing to this, keep losing to that. Say, hey, you know, um, what, what is it about? Why do I keep falling for your fireballs? Why do I keep falling for, I cannot, why can't I block that that way? So that, you have to have that constant communication, not just in your head, but out in the open and to build that confidence to understand the game better. Absolutely. And, you know, another important question that the attendees had, which I think is something that's really important on top of that is like, how do you really stay powered up after, you know, facing all these losses? Of course, fighting games are probably one of the hardest esports I have ever played because it's all down on you. There's so much that comes down emotionally and mentally on you. And then you have to perform physically on all of these very daunting you know, combos and, and frame traps and all of this stuff. But at the end of the day, you like you mentioned before, you need to have fun, but how do you stay powered up? How do you stay confident? How do you keep that, you know, drive going after all these L's? Well, you know, it's at, <laughs> there's no easy way to, to answer this because taking L's is the, it really is the most depressing thing. And you think it's you, you know, everything's like, it's just you, it's you, it's you. No, it's, it's about, it's, it's a journey, okay? like. Uh, if you have friends and support groups and, you know, mentors, you know, they, they will let you know certain things that you're not seeing, right? You do, um, we can't do this alone. That's the most important thing. Can't do this alone. Uh, I've had mentors, you know, my mentors had mentors and we had to figure it out some way because if you keep playing by yourself and taking these elves in your, in your corner, of course, yeah, you know, you're, you're really going to not want to play anymore but once you see that everybody else is going through the same thing um just you know be respective of that because everybody learns at a different pace and uh you know i can't guarantee you when you're you're gonna step out of that but if you go on if you keep going and, and really stay dedicated to uh to playing um just like any sport you're you're gonna make some achievements just make little goals here and there mm -hmm. okay and then uh you'll you should eventually see some success Exactly. Like, it's not something that happens overnight, you know, it's like, try not to give those losses power. Like, it's not a loss, it's a lesson, you know, we hear that a lot. And, you know, even down to like the lab work and not landing something in a match. Maybe sometimes you just like, for me, I'll practice something in lab and then I'll go into a match and I will do nothing but try to land that thing. I won't focus on anti errors or nothing else. I'm going to focus on the thing I was practicing, win or lose. I am just going to put all my attention into that one thing instead of putting all my attention into, oh my God, I don't want to lose or I don't want to lose my points or anything like that. And just focusing on what I can learn from this moment um, and just getting out of our own heads about being losers and stuff. It's going to happen. <laughs> it's gonna, we're going to lose game here or there. But I feel like we need that, you know, because even getting into tournaments and someone in the chat mentioned this. Um, which I also still deal with a lot. As anytime I'm, I step into a tournament match, I'm immediately trembling head to toe. My hands, I can't keep them steady. So I ha what kind of advice can you give to people since you have a lot of tournament experience about maintaining that anxiety and that composure? Well, you know, uh, sometimes playing against somebody, you're, you're very, you know, anxious and you're, you're not all there. You got these butterflies in your stomach. Uh, what I did in the past was I would just play by myself. I would warm up. Uh, I would either just practice my combos. Uh, I would play computer. Well, actually, in the arcades, that's all. You, there is no training. You have to play <laughs> yeah. computer, right? And uh, I would warm up my hands. So when you warm up your hands and you get the blood flowing, uh, you feel a bit more confident because now you can kind of feel every angle on the stick or whatever the thumb. Things start to you start to see the matrix a little bit, right? Because it just uh, it's just like in, in an exercise. You, you warm up, you stretch, uh, you do those things. Uh, maybe talking to people beforehand, be like, hey, who's in your bracket? Like, oh, okay. So it's like preparation. Mm -hmm. um, don't just go there cold, you know, have some sort of, um, you know, awareness of what's going on before you, you know, really give it a draw. Play you casuals. Want to <laughs> yeah. yeah, definitely. I mean, I feel like, a lot of the anxiety can sometimes come from not feeling confident enough, but if you're putting the work in and you're hitting the lab and stuff like that, and you know, you know what to do, 
you need to hang on to that because I feel like people will get in the hot seat and then they're not confident in themselves anymore. And you mentioned it yourself, like feeling confident is going to do wonders for you. Is there anything that you do to keep your confidence up whenever you're about to play? Like do you tell yourself something or do you just maybe go over notes to reinforce what you know? I, I'm actually pretty hardcore. Like uh, back, back in the days, and I'll always say back in the days, there was no such thing as seating. There is no such thing as like, well, let's separate like friends or anything. Yeah. We were we were a number on a scratch piece of paper and we put it in a fishbowl and that's how we picked who's playing who. And I had so many of those matches. I even played people that I drove with and or we're like, all right, well, we get a play. So um, to me, for me, I would, in the extreme part, I would gun for like the good people. Okay, because I just that's what my aspirations were. I mean, I want to play the best. I want to do this, right? And of course, I got my butt kicked. A lot of people don't want to do that. They're too that's that's too wild. So then play with find rivals, find people that uh, are around your skill level, slightly under or slightly higher. That way, you can have like a, a pretty decent win loss ratio, and not feel bad about getting destroyed like 0 and 10 or something like that. Right. So, um, it, it's finding that good balance of what you're comfortable with until you can kind of start seeing more wins than losses. Exactly. And thank you again so much for joining us, Alex. Yeah. You've been wonderful as always and sure. shedding your insight for all of us here. It's been absolutely amazing. Yeah, no for problem. everyone that is sticking with us right now, don't go anywhere because we are going to bring Jinhee and Drew back into the call and we're all just going to hang out and have a nice little discussion because you guys submitted so many questions and really, really good ones. And of course, we have these amazing panelists with us that we just have to take advantage of all the information that you guys can possibly get out of this webinar, which has already been a lot. But like I said, you guys have a lot of questions. But first things first, whoo, how are you guys? Welcome back. <laughs> We're good. Learned a lot. Awesome. <laughs> um, Drew was answering questions via text in the Q&A portion, but we're still pulling questions from there if you guys want to submit. And after we are no longer on camera, we're still going to keep this discussion up in the chat and a few more polls. So definitely stick around for that. But let's get to more of these questions, which are really, really good. I saw one earlier that I wanted to ask earlier, but I'm glad we have this moment to talk about. And this one is for Jin Han Drew. What should players look out for? Because you mentioned what sponsors look out for, but what about players and red flags players should look out for when being approached by sponsors or teams that they might not know anything about? Great good question. question. Yeah. Great question, because we were actually, we were talking about it off. Um, so I, I think, um, you know, there's, uh, there's all different types of, of orgs and there's all different types of, um, you know, contracts that, that come through. And I think, um, I know everyone gets so excited that they've um, been approached and and offered a contract, and so they don't really look through it very carefully because just the you know the thrill of of um, saying you're a sponsored um, pro is is just I guess it's kind of blinds you to a lot of things that you should be looking um, at. I think that you should. Um, you know, really, if if you have legal help um, or friends that you know do legal work, um, have them look over it um, or ask people in the community. I think there's enough players, um, TOs, just people in the community that have seen contracts and are familiar with it. Um, have them have a look at it. Uh, depending on the org, you know, you'll get offers for um, travel costs, um, all those financial things that we're talking about. There may be salary. Um, a component of it, um, as some of them will say, like specify certain tournaments that they'll, they'll um, pay for. But then um, many others don't, don't have the resources resources for that. Um, and so you have to make sure that you're looking at it and kind of weighing, you know, weighing the pros and cons of um, of that relationship. Um, it may be they may be offering you a lot of other things that's not financial. That's that's um, helpful. However, um, I have seen some um, contracts that are just, um, I think, not, not uh, uh, kind of um, a bit predatory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so if you don't know how to read legal language, it'll be worded in such a way that 
it almost makes you end up paying the org for for things, right? Um, and so I've because I actually I a lot of players that are not on my our team um, come to to us for advice, and they'll share offers that they've um, they've been given, and I have a, a law background, so I'll be reading stuff, and I'm like, did you see this? Um, and they didn't, right? And then you're you're locked in. And I know you guys have heard stories, uh, especially last year, of some really um, bad practices. Mm -hmm. So please be careful of that because it's not like it's oftentimes way better to just you know stream, get some donations, you know, do that that save from your job um, and and attend your own tournaments than be tied to some of these other. Um, these like yeah because you also um, you might lose out on other opportunities by being signed for that period of time so i'd look out for duration of contract um how much of your prize winnings they're taking and then look try to look specifically at what you have to do for the org and if there's any sort of like monetary uh, obligations you have to that org via the contract that to me can be a yeah. pretty big red flag. i mean it's really bad i saw one where it was like they would reimburse you for your travel only if you made top eight. And if you yeah. didn't, then you had to pay them everything back. So I was just like, wow. I mean, yeah. Our, our Evo, like we have players who, you know, Evo champs and a lot of, sometimes they, they wash out of pools, right? You can't guarantee a top eight. So, I mean, there's some, there's stories out there. I'm sure Alex, you've, you've probably you know, <laughs> advised a lot of people on very, very bad predatory contracts. So, yeah. Good question. Yeah, and you know, we talked a lot about, you know, doing things on your own, going to the events when you can, and also a lot about local scenes. So this one's for Alex. What about people who might not have a strong local scene or want to start building their local scene? It's pretty daunting. It can sound like a lot on paper from what our attendees mentioned in their question. So what's something they can do to help build their local scene and you know also create more opportunities out of it? Well, uh, you know, under under certain circumstances that we can't be together <laughs> for now, right. I guess the easiest way now is to, uh, you know, well, first support, just support the existing uh, events that are local to you, if there is any, um, and then jump into the online scene. Online scene is, is really, really hot right now because that's the only way we're getting competition. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, it's, it's obviously it's very, very, um, it could be very, TO running is very difficult. So you're going to have to take baby steps here. So um, it's a matter of uh, having a group of friends, uh, like a support group uh, that also has, you know, you, you can easily find people that play the same game in the same continent, in the same state area, whatnot, and because of online. Um, and uh, see, you know, uh, gather a few friends in a battle lounge, right? And, uh that's where it starts when you create a community that just means like i have somebody to play with it can be two people three people it don't it doesn't necessarily mean you need like evil amount of people to like start a community yeah. so like those are like the massive massive tournaments community starts with you and your opponent from there it's like hey we we host a battle lounge let me invite you into it and then there's you fill it up to eight people up in there and they're like, wow, we can run a tournament now. It's like, okay, <laughs> let's look it up and figure that out. It's like, cool, uh, let's reach out to the tournament organizer. How do you do this, right? It's like, hey, reach out to me. So you need a challenge account or a Smash GG account, uh, you know, have people sign up, uh, tell them time of day, create a social. So like, there, there's steps to it, um, but your passion will, <laughs> all the, your passion yeah. will let you do this all day long. It's, it's, uh, it's the same as playing like we all want to play so much but then now you're going to want to play with everybody that's that's what happened to me you know i mean i play with people but i, I i'm greedy i like to play more so <laughs> so that that's how you would like at least the basis of online tournaments offline tournaments it, it's kind of the same way but it takes you know, it, it's, it's a much longer process depending on where you live so i understand not every region has so many people so you know uh, and if you guys ever need uh, assistance, always feel free to reach out to me and I'll help you out. And I also think a lot of the points that we've already covered during this webinar could help you start up your local scene, whether it be 
strengthening your networking skills to go to a local venue and coordinate with them and collaborate with them to possibly hold a local and then using your social presence to maybe gather around people in your local area. We covered a lot of these things and we're talking about them in regards to playing video games and getting signed to a team, but a lot of these can be used for anything that you're passionate about, which kind of leads to our next question, which is from me, because I find this to be something very important. But for you guys, I want both of you to answer this, but um, Drew and Jin He, you guys can start. But I think there is a very important line between creating things and doing things because you want to be sponsored and creating things and doing things because you're passionate about it. And then in the process, you'll get a sponsor. So yeah. can you guys explain about how from your point of view, I feel like those things can be pretty obvious. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that that's something that I used to be in, in the music industry where a lot of people would try to make songs or make records to get signed or to have that big hit um, versus people who are making the music that they really wanted to make. And I think that the most successful people are always the people who make the music or the art or the concept that they want to make because they want to see it out there. They want to share it with the world. Um, the same goes for when we're looking at the uh, content that people in the FGC are making. The stuff mm -hmm. where it's like truly uh, something that is a passion of theirs. It's like their own character that they're a specialist of, or they're highlighting their own scene through online tournaments, locals. Um, that kind of passion is infectious. It really catches your attention and it's really genuine. I think it is a bit transparent sometimes when people are doing things that are very much to catch the eyes of sponsors and, and really you know, try to get sponsored. Um, I think being genuine is important. Yeah. So I think that what, you know, we're talking about like locals and whatnot too, right? So I think that if you do have the passion for it and you create that circle, that community around you, like Alex was saying, whether it's from a couple of the friends that you play with and then you start to grow that, right? Um, one, you, you help to grow your community and your scene. So then there's more attention to you and then you are seen as a leader. Um, what we had talked about when we go out and we ask people about different, um, you know, players, um, you're gonna get that like good re references as well, right? Versus the people that are just looking out for themselves and they're just doing it for like, you don't you don't create that that network and that community that's going to speak on your behalf and also help create opportunities for yourself to do well. So. Um, Yes, don't just it's it's community, you know, that's in our that's in the name, yeah. right? Yeah, like, <laughs> like, it's really important. And what's your take on it, Alex? Uh, you know, my friends at UIU said it like the best. <laughs> it's about uh, being genuine, organic. Uh, the, 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 the stuff that I like to see is quality of life videos, meaning like, uh, how to improve your execution? How do you, uh, how do you fight a certain matchup? Uh, like, what do you do to prepare yourself for an event? Like, uh, things that like people do in everyday activities, right? Because it's real, right? Versus like, mm -hmm. I'm just gonna yell into the void and make a controversial video because look at me, right? <laughs> like those, yeah, those those <laughs> those get you know they're they're funny, but then they get tiresome and you, you know it doesn't really improve your one time. I, in, in, in the world of Street Fighter or even any fighting game, you want to improve yourself. You want to, you know, be better at the game. You want to network better. You want to jump in the world of esports or whatnot. So, you know, getting uh, tips and getting, you know, quality of life, uh, you know, expertise, it's free. Like, right, no, normally this stuff, you would have to go to a seminar and pay for it. <laughs> but they're, they're, they're putting all that wisdom out there and, uh, the best you can do is support them too, because you know they're they're putting their time uh, to do this for us, and hopefully you can meet them and uh, maybe share your ideas, and it spawns into something a, a collaborative effort. So oh, yeah. uh, I think I think all of this stuff uh, really goes hand in hand to why we're here today. Like honestly, all of you guys, Persia, UIU, and we've all collaborated in an event together with players or you know tournaments. Um, I mean, we're even doing the show, so <laughs> as, as organic as it can be. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. All right, so I'm gonna wrap this up with one more question, but like I mentioned before, you guys, we're still gonna be taking a couple questions via chat and a couple polls after this, so don't go too far. But 
this is something that was a question from one of our attendees that I thought was really intriguing because for, you know, people like you, Valle, who have been in scene for forever, and people like you, Jin He and Drew, who are looking at this from a different POV than players, what's something that you want to see in the community that's new and innovative, that's going to be that next thing that's going to catch your eye, both as an organization and as a member of the community? So I, I think that what's great, we have a, a a great amount of coverage of uh, tournaments of of people playing against each other. Um, it kind of speaks to what Alex just spoke on. I love to see more quality of life and and kind of the life of a player, um, the lifestyle that you need to put into it, the practice you need to put into it. More content around that, whether it is through you know YouTube videos. I think IRL streams are a great kind of window into what a tournament looks like. Um, I know that sometimes at big tournaments like Evo or uh, CEO, what have you, there'll be people who are in the pools, um, uh, various pools doing IRL streams. And I think that gives people a real nice sense of what these tournaments are like and makes it less scary to kind of mm -hmm. jump in. Mm -hmm. So I'd love to see more kind of uh, lifestyle and life of a player uh, content out there. Thanks. Yeah, I, I mean, you're just saying like, I think because of the, the, the a pandemic and how we've been using mm -hmm. more technology. I would love to see some of this being more incorporated into when we get offline as well. Um, mm -hmm. I know, you know, right uh, before you've got the stream, right? Um, but I think there's ways where I would love to be able to, as if I were there, kind of pick and choose some of the, the, the pools that that I'm able to watch and stuff. So I think there's like a lot of interesting opportunities to integrate the kind of technology that we have with like, you know, the, the, the scene and give um, not only the people that have that great opportunity to go to that tournament, but the ones that don't, and they're in some, you know, um, some town a, a, across the, the world to like get a flavor, a feel mm -hmm. as if they're walking through that venue or like, like seeing over someone's shoulder into a pool thing. I just, I, I hope we're able to start integrating uh, some innovations there. I guess it's my turn. Okay. <laughs> um, so uh, I would love to see more summits, actually a summit. Uh, you know, there's always tournaments, events and stuff like that, that are conventions, but there's not really, I mean, there's panels and like, like what we're doing and, and giving great information, mm -hmm. but there's no like workshops. I would love to see workshops in the finding aid community like how to actually run a tournament how to you know utilize social media how to like and and have mentors behind this too like uh we're already 30 plus years with street fighter so it's like there, there's so many people just like searching these videos all day long and trying mm -hmm. to find like what like what do i do like how to become a good player how do i even get into esports and all that stuff and and you gotta like search for all this stuff when well, we can have it all in a summit and, uh, you know, it, it can be from, you know, the sky's the limit. And obviously, unfortunately, we're in a pandemic, but I mean, who knows, like, this, this is like something like this, it could be at a live event and you would have um, plenty of like, uh, you know, pro players, you can have team organizations, uh, you can have publishers, and they, they would really, it, it would really benefit us all because, uh, you know, we need to teach the next generation of how to move this industry forward. Uh, I, I even though like we just we love mashing buttons all day long and that's part of the battle but you know it, it, to even get more people vested into the scene not all of them play it's weird mm -hmm. not all of them play competitively they like street mm -hmm. fighter they may like the anime they may like the art like they, the the music they'll watch competition but maybe they're you know they're t maybe they are artists you know maybe the animation maybe they do music maybe they're programmers and then they're going to go out there and be like, yo, this is how, this is how to, 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 to program a, a fireball. Right. And they're like, wow, I didn't even know, like, you know, you, you guys exist to do these things. Um, yeah. So <laughs> yeah, it's just a movement of, uh, you know, getting this worldwide. Cause I, I know it's, yeah. it's, 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 it's what I've always wanted to see. And, but we're in a standstill right now. So. Yeah. <laughs> I, I thought of something and um, while you were, talking acts and, and um i mean this is kind of we've, we've talked about it. i didn't know how we can do it but um 
you know, all the, the tournaments are for like finding out who the best is, right? But going back to like my childhood growing up when I would go to Taekwondo tournaments, um, you didn't have like a green belt fighting a black belt, right? And so for me, something that I would love to see, um, whether it's in tournaments or maybe online things, is to encourage the people who are just starting out mm -hmm. to not be so intimidated about competing and not be intimidated to going to an offline tournament or an online and not end up in, you know, pools going against like, you know, the lap. I mean, that's exciting too, being able to play in pools against like an Evo champion. But um, if there's a way to make it not so intimidating and more welcoming to mm -hmm. the beginners and intermediate players so that you do have like, you know, you, when when you're a green belt and yeah. you happen to be the best green belt at the tournament, you got the medal too, right? So it's just something kind of off the wall. But I, as someone who doesn't really play, and if I started and I would want something. So you don't just go, oh, let's go to that <laughs> Baby <story>. steps, right. <laughs> you know, baby steps. Because so. <laughs> for a lot of new players, they'll work so hard, practice so hard to get to the tournament. Two matches later, they're out of the event. You know, they go on two and that's it. That's where you take advantage of playing casual games and stuff like that. But it's really hard to channel that same tournament experience, right? Like we mentioned before, anxiety and everything like that comes with, you know, the reduction of it comes with experience. But when you go zero and two at a tournament and only really get those two matches to get that tournament experience spaced out once a month, if you're fortunate enough to travel that much, so yeah, I totally understand that is definitely, I think, a good idea as well because there's room for so much. You know, we shouldn't box ourselves into what we consider is what should be competitive fighting games. I feel like there's room for a lot of things. And while we are stuck at home on pandemic, I've also felt like this time has been just the amount of downtime that I needed to make next year when things are hopefully safe again to be even better than they would have been this year had there not been a pandemic. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we just have to find the silver linings where we can. Mm -hmm. The silver lining right now is that although we're wrapping up, you guys can still chat with us because we are keeping the chat lines open. We're still going to be answering some of your questions, although we won't be on screen. So you can stick around for that because we also are going to have some polls for you to answer as well. If you would like to, you can go on social and use hashtag SF5StreetSmarts to follow up this discussion. Let us know how you enjoyed the webinar and to remind everybody else that this is only one of many that are on the way. We're going to be talking to even more amazing guests. We're going to be teaching you everything that we can about getting into esports and leveling up your game. So you guys already know I'm Persia. It has been absolutely amazing and to all of our guests today, thank you so much for joining us. To all of our attendees, you're the best. Hope this helps you and hopefully we'll see you on the next webinar. Thank you guys so much again and take care. We'll see you next time.